Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for this morning is the account of Penny Cross from Acts chapter 2. Dear friends of our Savior, sometimes it's easy to overlook the Holy Spirit. And the reason is quite clear. The message of the Bible is all eyes on Jesus. It really doesn't make any difference what Bible passages we're looking at. It's all eyes on Jesus. It can be, hey David's, the Lord is my shepherd. It can be Isaiah's, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. It can be our Savior's own words in the upper room, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. It might be Pontius Pilate pointing to Jesus and saying, Behold the man. It's all about Jesus. If you think of the famous places in the Bible, it's all about Jesus. Whether it's the manger in Bethlehem, the Mount of Transfiguration, the Upper Room in Jerusalem, the Garden of Gethsemane, Calvary's Holy Mountain, Joseph's Lonely Garden. It's all about Jesus. The famous pictures that we have of God are all about Jesus. Whether it's Jesus walking on the water, Jesus feeding the 5,000, Jesus blessing the children, Jesus hanging on the cross, or Jesus after his resurrection on Easter, it's all about Jesus. Martin Luther has an interesting observation about this. He makes this point. Jesus could have done all the things that he did. Yes, Jesus could have even died on the cross a thousand times for your sins. But if you have never heard about it, Jesus would do you absolutely no good whatsoever. Luther made that comment to a group that he called enthusiasts. The enthusiasts of that time were people who said, we were forgiven at the cross of Calvary, and not the word and sacrament. And consequently, because they believe that we were forgiven at the cross of Calvary, which we are, they said there is no need for word and sacrament. Luther's response to the enthusiasts of his day was this. Who told you that your sins were forgiven at the cross of Calvary? Where did you learn that everything was accomplished in Jesus Christ at the cross? How did you come to know these things? And his answer to the enthusiast was, you came to know this through the Bible, through the Word of God, specifically through the Gospel. Through the Gospel in Word and Sacrament. So you dare not say that even though our sins are forgiven on the cross of Calvary, that we do not receive the forgiveness of sins through Word and Sacrament. And this is exactly where the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit inspired the Bible for us, gave the exact words to holy men that he would have written down for our salvation. He also gave the gifts to the church that is needed, the gifts of wisdom and understanding, the gifts of preaching and teaching, so that this message of Jesus can be broadcast around the entire world. It was Jesus who said about the Holy Spirit, He will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said. It is the risen Savior that sends the Holy Spirit, and therefore these blessings of Jesus come to us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you want to think about powerful things, two things you might think of are wind and fire. We know the power of wind here in the Sonoran uh, Desert. In the summertime, we often have high winds with our monsoons, and we know the damage that those winds can do. 
They can blow shingles off of a shingle roof. They can knock branches off of a tree. They can knock over electric lines so you don't have electricity until the power company repairs it. Back in the Midwest and the South, they have tornadoes. Tornadoes can level farms and factories. They can destroy an entire little village. They can take a section of a city and make it flat. Hurricanes are along the coasts. They destroy coastline, they can destroy boats, and they can flood major cities. Wind is a very powerful force. Fire is another formidable force in our world. Fire can destroy your home in just a short period of time. Fire can destroy sections of big cities like the Great Fire of London in 1666 or the Great Chicago Fire in 1871. Fire, too, is a very strong and formidable force. We are not surprised that wind and fire are associated with the power and strength of the Holy Spirit as well. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is sometimes associated with wind and sometimes with fire. And they are there to remind us of the great power that the Spirit came with on Pentecost. There was a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night. He wanted to ask Jesus some questions about the way to heaven and Jesus' other teachings. And Jesus made this point with Nicodemus. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That went over Nicodemus' head. He's taking a physical birth. Impossible. So Jesus explains what it is to be born again. He repeats, but puts it this way. Unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Human parents give birth to human beings. But the spirit gives birth to spiritual beings. And then Jesus explains how the spirit works. He says, the wind, the wind, the wind blows wherever it wants, and you hear its sound. But you cannot tell from where it comes or to where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That's the way the wind works, isn't it? You can go to bed at night and it's perfectly calm outside. You can wake up in the morning and it's perfectly calm outside. You walk outside and you have broken branches on your yard. A bunch of garbage and trash is blown into your front trees and bushes. There's a great big mound of pine needles from your neighbor's pine tree over against your wall. You draw the obvious conclusion that during the night, the wind blew. You didn't hear it. You were asleep. You didn't feel it. You didn't sense it. But you knew the wind blew by what it did. And so was everyone who was born of the Spirit. The Spirit comes in, into our lives, in our hearts. We cannot sense his coming into our heart. We cannot take our eyes and see it. We cannot take our fingers and touch it. We can't take our nose and smell it or our mouth and taste it. But we know that the Spirit's been in our heart. How? By the changes he's made. I was spiritually blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was an unbeliever, and now I believe in Jesus as my Savior. The Spirit is like that great wind that has the power to make these wonderful changes in our life. The Spirit is also like a fire. Very often in the Bible, God is pictured as being present in a fire. Think of Jesus, or think of Moses seeing the Lord in a burning bush in the Sinai Peninsula. Or think of how God led the people out of Egypt to the Promised Land with a pillar of cloud by day and in the form of a pillar of fire by night. Think of Isaiah's vision into heaven where he sees before the throne of God a big bed of coals that are able to be picked up and purified the lips of Isaiah to equip him to preach the gospel. Fire 
gives light, it gives heat, it gives energy, and it purifies. And when God sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost as a fire, he did that to give light to our lives. When he sent the Spirit on Pentecost, that was to warm our hearts with the love of God and Jesus Christ. When he sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, it was to refine the faith that the Spirit has placed in our heart, burning away the dross and letting the pure gold remain. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why St. Paul tells us, do not quench the Spirit. Do not extinguish the Spirit. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Remember the Emmaus disciples as they were walking to Emmaus on Easter and Jesus was with them, but they didn't recognize. Later on they said, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the way and opened the scriptures for us? The Spirit comes as a fire to warm our hearts in the love of God. So we're not surprised that the Spirit came with signs of wind and fire, are we? But this was not a normal wind, and it was not a normal fire. It was a miraculous wind. We are told that it was a sound like the sound of a mighty rushing wind in the room where they were staying. It was so loud that it could be heard outside the building, and people came running to see what was going on. We are told that it was not a normal fire. It was a miracle fire for the day, for the event. We are told that something like a fireball came into the room and it separated into individual flames so that an individual flame of this miracle fire hovered above each of the persons who had gathered together for that Pentecost. That was a reminder that the gift of the Holy Spirit is not just for the church in general, but for each one of you individually. You all have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this wind and fire that came on Pentecost was also there to leave no doubt in the hearts and minds of the people that this was from God. In fact, if it taught anything at all, it teaches us that that person who came to them that day and enabled all this to happen is indeed God himself. He is the third person of the Trinity. He is God, the Holy Spirit. He is the one whom we confess in the Nicene Creed that he is the Lord and the giver of life. These events leave no doubt that this spirit who was given on Pentecost is the gift that the Father had promised and the one that Jesus said that he would send from the Father. It leaves no doubt in anybody's mind that this is the gift that Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for. And there is no doubt that the spirit came with mighty power, the power of wind and fire. He came with a power that's able to shatter our hearts of stone, the ones we were born with, and we place them with a heart of life, of living flesh, creating new life inside of us. He comes with the ability to forgive and to justify and to save. When the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, it's important to realize, though, that he did not use this wind and this fire as a magic wand to put over the people, and all of a sudden, 3,000 people become believers. That is not the way it worked on Pentecost, and that is not the way it worked today. And the reason is because of the third miracle on Pentecost. This took place on the Old Testament Feast of Pentecost. It means 50, 50 days after Passover. It was a celebration of the early harvest, but it had this that made it somewhat unique. Pentecost, along with the Great Day of Atonement and Passover, was one of the three festivals that every Jewish male had to return to Jerusalem and worship at the temple and sacrifice there. And because it was that kind of festival where every Jewish male adult had to come and worship at the temple, people from all over the Asia, all over the Roman Empire were there. Matter of fact, Luke mentions people from 15 different countries and provinces were in Jerusalem for this festival and were present at the very first Pentecost. Many of these people were Jewish 
her background that had moved to other provinces, and many of them were converts to Judaism. In either case, the normal language that these people spoke were the language of the country or province from which they came. And then comes this third miracle. As they're gathered together, all of a sudden, in an instant's time, they were able to hear what the apostles were preaching about Jesus in their own native language. In an instant, the apostles were able to speak in languages that they had never learned or studied before, Latin, Greek, Arabic, and any other language of those 15 countries that were there. This is something that had never happened before. These people had come to Jerusalem three times a year all their adult life. Never before had they heard about the love of God and the mercy of God and the compassion of God in their own language before. Before they spoke Hebrew or Aramaic, the local language. But now they heard the wonderful works of God in the language they clearly understood. And for many of these people, that's the first time they ever heard about Jesus. He had just been crucified and risen from the dead about a month to two months earlier. And now they're hearing about Jesus and salvation and forgiveness of sins for the very first time in clear, concise language that they understood every word of it because it was in their own native tongue. That indeed was a miracle. But as usually happens, there are two opinions about what really took place on Pentecost. Most of the people were amazed at this great miracle of God, that they could hear the word of God in their own language. But some people who listened to these other languages being spoken thought they were all gibberish. And I can understand that if I go to a grocery store and I hear someone speaking in a language I don't understand, it sounds like gibberish to me. And they drew the conclusion that the apostles were not filled with the Holy Spirit, or that this was from God, but that they'd been drinking that morning, drinking alcohol, and that they had too much to drink. And at 9 o'clock in the morning at a high festival, preaching it to the people in the upper room, that they were drunk. It's at this point where Peter stands up and explains Pentecost. And he clarifies that this is what the prophet Joel had prophesied, and this is what Jesus had promised. And he comes before these people and reminds them that these people are not drunk, but rather that this is the Holy Spirit at work in their life, and they are witnesses of it. In fact, everything about Pentecost has to do with preaching the gospel. It's preaching the gospel in our churches, preaching the gospel in our home, preaching the gospel in our communities, preaching gospel in our missions, preaching the gospel around the world. And more than that, when the Spirit is poured out, Peter reminded them that he's poured out upon all of God's people. And he mentions all the different people, young men, old men, young women, older women, children. He mentions every age group that is possibly there, young and old and anything in between. It's clear that he was poured out upon people from at least these 15 countries and really every other believer, race, nationality, citizenship made no difference. The gift is given to Christians. And because that is the main theme of Pentecost, the Spirit enabling the church to proclaim the Christ, we see that each one of us as individuals has been equipped by the Spirit to do so. Now that doesn't mean we're all in the public ministry, the church of course, but on Pentecost the Spirit created that great universal priesthood of all believers, entrusting the message of the gospel to each and every one of us so we can proclaim it to others. Can you imagine that anybody in Jerusalem that day who was from one of those 15 countries did not go back home and tell their wife and children and neighbors and friends what they had witnessed that Pentecost in Jerusalem. Do you think they did not tell them about the sound of the wind, the sight of the fire, the miracle of languages? And do you think for a minute they did not tell them about the message that Peter proclaimed, the 
forgiveness of sins of Jesus Christ as your Savior, that the Messiah has come, that he's died on the cross for the payment of the sins of the world, for my sins, for your sins, that he has risen again as a conqueror of death, and that he has ascended into heaven to rule all things for the good of his church. And the first part of that rule is to send the Holy Spirit to us. It is easy to overlook the Holy Spirit because the message of the Holy Spirit in the Bible is a message that we need to focus our attention on Jesus. The Holy Spirit never draws attention to himself, but he says, see the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. But today on Pentecost, we focus our attention on the Holy Spirit. And as we do that, we see that he has highly gifted each and every one of us, given us faith, given us spiritual gifts, and trusted his gospel to us. And as we believe and speak the words of God, we are assured of one thing among many other things. We are assured that the Holy Spirit has never overlooked us. Amen. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus.